Hello, good morning again. Good to see you guys. If you didn't feel festive this morning, I hope now that you've seen some really small shepherds, you are feeling like it is Christmas time. It feels appropriate to say Merry Christmas today because this is kind of peak Rehope Christmas Sunday right here. And we have reached week two of our Advent series as we anticipate the birth of Jesus and celebrating that together this Christmas. Meaning today is Peace Week. And then next week, we have joy. And then the week after that, which is Christmas Eve, we will be thinking about love. And then it is Christmas Day. And then it's that glorious week between Christmas and New Year where you don't know what day it is and you don't know how many pigs and blankets you've eaten and you don't know why Chad Michael Murray is in a Christmas movie playing an angel. But it's okay, because anything goes. Last week, Stevie shared with us about hope and about the power of hope in Jesus to sustain us even when it feels like our hope here has been shattered. And talking about hope, thinking about hope leads us really nicely into thinking about peace today because it feels hard to have peace if you don't have hope. Hopelessness so often is at the root of lots of peacelessness, lots of fear. And yet, if we have hope, then it's like, okay, peace and joy and love have a place to land. They have space to grow in our lives. I'd say quickly, if you feel low on hope, don't worry. Stick with us. This is a church about hope. We have it written on our wall. We have it in the name regarding hope. Church, stick with us for a while. We believe that there is hope to be found this Christmas as well. But I wonder what you think of when you think about peace. Sometimes I find it easier to identify peace by thinking about times when I have definitely not felt peace. (laughs) When I was in Iraq this spring, one of my favorite things about the city that I lived in was its theme parks. It was a small city and it had four theme parks, which I think is a pretty good ratio. And these theme parks were bright and fun and pretty wild. And they kind of came to life after 10 p.m. Like everyone was out, kids and all, into the wee hours. And they had everything that you know and love about a theme park. They had dodgems that would take the wind out of you. They had candy floss the size of a child for about 50p. And they had every sort of like slightly sketchy roller coaster that a girl who grew up going to Barry's in Northern Ireland could dream of. Now, I like to think I'm pretty fearless when it comes to rides at a theme park, but there was this one night that my friend Nick and I sat down in a ride, and all it really had to boast of was that it was one of those ones that was going to go like up and over, and you'd be upside down. That was like the whole thrill, the whole thing that you were paying for. And you know when you sit in a ride and you notice like the guy operating it is just a little bit young? (laughs) And then... He lets you sit there just a little bit too long before he comes to like strap you in. So then you start to observe things that you would rather not observe. Like you maybe start to see detail and you see like a little bit of rust. And maybe you take your life into your own hands. You decide, you know what, I'm going to pull this down over myself. So then you pull it down over yourself and then it kind of clicks and you're like, wait, wait, wait. Though it's clicked and there's like a gap between me and it. So then you're like, maybe I make myself bigger. Maybe I'll fill it out, or maybe like I need to like click it in further towards myself, but you can't because it's, it's kind of locked, but it's making like a little bit of a weird kind of clicky sound. And then you start to do some physics, even though you're not a scientist, but you start to imagine like, how does this keep me in when we go up and over? And just how long will I be up there for? And, and then you might laugh to yourself because you remember that you paid for this and you chose this. <laughs> And sometimes the question emerges, though, am I actually going to be okay? And I think oftentimes in life, uh, peacelessness can be connected to a similar question. Am I going to be okay? And maybe a second question comes if we're going through something that's particularly difficult. Does anyone care what I'm going through? And if you have faith in God, then maybe it's God, do you care? what I'm going through. Are you able to help me? And just like Nick and I sitting on that ride, sometimes the longer you're in the moment, the harder it gets to ignore those kind of questions as they rise to the surface. I'm going to veer a little bit from Christmas stories today. I'm going to read from the book of Mark because I have a newfound appreciation for this gospel, which I want to just 
briefly connect to a very quick plug for Scotland Bible School. I studied theology at university and I don't regret it, but I came out feeling pretty dry, like my love for the Bible was pretty low, and relatively speaking, doing an SBS here feels like like a fountain of life. Like it feels like hard work, but it feels like life-giving, and I feel like my love for the Bible is going up. And so, I mean, maybe it's just a quick encouragement that if there's something that God is putting on your heart or speaking to you about for the next season, I thought I had to swap mics or something there. I was like, gas is moving. If there's something that God's speaking to you about and you're wondering like, no, it feels too late or it doesn't feel like the right time or I don't know how I'm going to fit it into my life, just if God's speaking about it, trust him, you can do it. Anyway, um, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 4. If you want to follow along in your own Bible, you can, but the words will be on the screen. So from verse 35, it says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. It's Jesus. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I love this story. But I think in recent years, I'd maybe distanced myself from it just a little, maybe just due to familiarity, maybe thinking like, yeah, there was a storm. It's a good story about Jesus's power, but like I wasn't there. It was a long time ago and I wasn't there. But then revisiting this recently for SBS and and trying to read this story through the lens of the original readers and seeing, I think for the first time in my life, how over the top purposeful Mark was in how he pieced together his gospel story, how guided by the Holy Spirit he chose what to include, what details to include, what order to put it in, all to communicate truth to his readers. Italian Christians in Rome, about 70 AD, socially, culturally hated, persecuted, facing literal terrors because of their new identity in Jesus. And so, With that in mind, Mark's recording of the disciples' plea, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Like it hit different with them in mind. Because I imagine they were asking a very similar question. Now they weren't on that boat, but because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible through human authors, it was a story for their storm. And it can be a story for my storm and for your storm as well. Not because we face the same circumstances as the guys on the boat or as those Italian Christians a long time ago, but because we can know the same God who has the power to say, peace, be still. The same Jesus who is called the Prince of Peace. And there's a few things I see in this story that I just want to highlight today. Firstly, the mood is panic. Now Mark as a book is like fast paced from the start. Jesus is teaching, delivering, healing, repeat. It's all go, 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 all the action. But then suddenly in this story, it's like, okay, suddenly it's nighttime and they're on the water and there is a storm that has broken out and the waves are crashing and the water is coming in, which means the boat is sinking. And there's like no gradual atmospheric build here. As soon as we hear the disciples speak, they think they're going to die. And they've been following Jesus for a while. Jesus hasn't been revealing himself yet publicly to be the Messiah, the one who was to come, but they've been with him and he has been doing stuff. Like they've seen him heal people, they've seen him perform miracles, they'd seen him set someone free from an evil spirit. So they've seen his spiritual authority. They'd seen him touch a man who was suffering from leprosy and that the man was made well. So they'd seen his compassion and his power to heal They'd seen him forgive and heal a man who couldn't walk. So they'd seen his power to do what should have been impossible, both to heal but also to forgive. And then the storm hits and he's there and yet they think they're going to die. And I could be tempted to wonder, I might be tempted to wonder, is it because it was something different? 
Is it because it was something new, something bigger? Because sometimes that happens for us. Something different, new or bigger comes along and we panic because our vision of what God can do maybe needs to expand in that. But then for these guys, like some of them were fishermen. And although a storm might have been different and new and bigger for me, maybe it was extreme for them, but maybe like more familiar territory. Maybe sometimes that's worse. Maybe we can imagine what Jesus has the power to do for someone else or for something out there. But maybe when it comes to our own situation that is making peace feel impossible, it's maybe like, no, but you know, Jesus, yeah, okay, maybe you can do that and you can do that, but like I know this and I know how it works and actually I see the water coming in, so that means that the boat's going down. Reading this story from our safe, warm seats a long time later, we might be tempted to think, guys, like, the living God is in the boat. <laughs> You're going to be okay. But, but they hadn't read the end of the story, and they, they hadn't read through the Gospels in their Bible read-through, and they didn't know who Jesus was yet fully. I'm pretty sure I would panic. And I know who Jesus is. I have the book of Revelation I have faith in that Jesus. I have faith in risen, exalted at the right hand of God right now, Jesus. And yet, I know that there are still things in my life that can creep in, things can happen, and the temptation is to feel panic because either I forget that Jesus is with me, I forget what he can do, or I believe the lie that somehow my thing, little or big, is somehow beyond his power or beyond his care. The disciples needed a dramatic peace intervention, not just for the storm, but for their fear. And maybe you know that sometimes fear is a storm, that sometimes it doesn't seem to matter what we're facing, relatively speaking, we want peace, and yet anxiety seems to be more and more defining of our generation and the ones to come after us. And maybe it's not new. Maybe the older generation just used to call it stress. Some spiritualities and religions have said you can find perfect inner peace. Because as long as people have been people, I think we've probably longed for peace. And some different spiritualities have said you can find inner peace if you learn how to like, let go of every want and need and desire. If you learn how to detach yourself from basically everything physical, everything material, then you can finally achieve that perfect inner peace. And if to to you, like it does to me, that feels kind of impossible, then I have good news today, which is that Christianity doesn't promise us that. It doesn't say that you can achieve perfect peace or that you should try, but it says, here is the Prince of Peace. Have him in the midst of your dark night, in the midst of your storm. Follow him and he can be your peace even when life is not peaceful. In Jesus' day, storms in life, suffering, would have been typically understood to have been a result or connected to sin or displeasing the gods in some way. And Jesus was going to flip that understanding on its head. But if we're not careful, I think we can slip into kind of thinking the same thing. Like if life is stormy, if things are hard, then maybe I'm off track or for whatever reason, I've kind of slipped out of God's love and care. But Jesus turned that upside down. People would come to him and say, who sinned that this man was born blind? Was it his parents or was it him? And he would say it was neither. But this has happened so that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. And even in this story, Jesus instigates the journey. Jesus is in the boat. And the boat like, it's not facing, like, a kind of hypothetical storm. It's also not facing a storm where it's like, okay, the wind and the waves are held by some, held back by some sort of, like, divine force field because these guys are really close to Jesus. No, like, the, the water is coming in, and the boat is filling with water, and the disciples would have been wet. And for the original readers, hated, persecuted, dying, their storms that they were facing weren't because they were off track. Their storms were often because they were painfully on track, faithfully on track. And so this said to them, and it can say to us, 
take heart. Let faith in the one who is more powerful than anything you are up against. Let that deal with your fear. Sometimes there are storms of our own making. That happens. But sometimes the stormy path is the godly path. Sometimes the peaceful path isn't. And if we need to find our own peace, then we're probably going to live our lives trying to avoid risky ground. We'll make comfort our king. Try to basically recreate the feeling of being in the corner part of our sofa with a candle burning and Netflix on. But if there is more to life and if Jesus is who he said he was, then I'm going to want to follow him even into storms where my faith might be tested or my lack of faith might be exposed, that I might see something new of his power, of what he can do. Because he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Meaning with him, we might walk through darkness, but we don't have to walk in darkness because we have the light of life in him. And sometimes, sometimes we don't need another teaching moment to know that. Sometimes we need a life moment where peace has to break through or a life moment where we feel desperate enough to reach out for him and we find to our great relief that he is there, that he can be found. Mark tells us in the story that the disciples took Jesus in the boat with them just as he was. And I don't really know why he says that, but I asked that question this week. And it made me wonder, Roman Christians didn't have the New Testament scriptures and they didn't have podcasts, and they didn't have soaking playlists, and they didn't have books about the ruthless elimination of hurry. But they'd put their faith in Jesus, and they had the Holy Spirit. So they had his presence, and they had his voice. And it made me question for myself, is that enough for me? Do I consider that enough for peace? Because Mark says there was a great storm, and then there is Jesus, his presence, and his voice, and then there is a great calm. And I wonder, do we allow Jesus' presence and his voice to have the power it can in our lives? Or do we too quickly turn to like other supplies and other things and other solutions? Have we put on so many little like life jackets of our own making that we never actually have to reach out for him in the way that we could? To see his power as we could? There's a great storm and there's a great calm, and we could end there, and that would be quite a nice ending to the story, but it's not how the story ends. So let's look at the end of the story. It says, Jesus calms the storm, and then it says, the disciples were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this man? The storm's over, but they're not at peace. Maybe you've experienced something like that in life, where something is wrong, or something feels unsettled, and then it gets resolved, and yet your unsettledness just shifts because something else always comes up. And we experience how our circumstances changing isn't enough to deal with our fear at its root. And in case like me, you've reached a point where you're like, okay, my circumstance here might not be changing, but I'm not satisfied with peacelessness anymore. Jesus connects for us here pretty clearly that their fear relates to their faith. It's their little faith in him. It's their little faith that means that they have high fear. After the storm is calmed, the New Living Translation says, the disciples were absolutely terrified, saying, who is this man? They asked each other. That's not how I would portray the end of the story. If I was going to write a nice story about how God brings peace, I would be like, okay, there's a great storm. The disciples cry out to Jesus. Jesus brings calm, says, peace, be still. Everything is calm. Everything is peaceful. And the disciples marveled at God's peace-bringing power. Turn page, next story. But that's because I tend to think peace in a situation equals peace for me. So my prayer life is a lot of like, Jesus, fix it. Jesus, change it. Jesus, please. And that's okay and that's good and he wants me to pray. He wants me to cry out to him and he can do that. And sometimes he'll do that and that does mean peace for me. But there's something more here that I want to take hold of and I want to remember this Christmas that maybe perfect peace for us isn't found in peace so much as it'll ever be found in the one who is able to bring peace. I came into this year 
And perhaps understandably, I looked to sabbatical that I was about to take in January. I looked forward to some time away, to a new year, thinking, okay, maybe this year will be a year of breakthrough and answers and calm. And I looked forward to that. And honestly, there's been some breakthrough and there's been some answers, but there's also some things in life that just continue to rage. There's prayers that are still unanswered. There's things I would still love to see change. And honestly, approaching another Christmas and another New Year, there's a temptation to panic. Often attached to those age-old questions, am I going to be okay? Does God care? In Mark's telling of this story, two questions ring out. Teacher, do you care that we are perishing? God, do you care? And then, who then is this man? Who is this man? The disciples would eventually come to know who Jesus was. They would come to know that he was the Messiah, the promised one to come. Not the warrior type they expected, but a suffering servant. And they would come to know that he cared as they would see act of compassion after act of compassion after act of compassion take him all the way to the cross where he would give everything for them and us. That they and us, that we might be reconciled to the God who made us and who loves us forever. They would see that. They would come to know who he was and it would change everything for them. They wouldn't be trembling in fear anymore like this, (laughs) but they would go out to live and to die for him. As I look back on this year, yeah, not every human storm has been calmed, but coming to know Jesus' power and compassion even just a little bit more, I love him more than I did this time last year. And so that means that although my flesh might cry out for solutions, my spirit can be at peace because I have faith in the one who is powerful enough to deal with anything. I have faith in who he is. I have faith that he cares. And although my schedule could do with less in it, and although I could do with setting my phone down more, and although there's situations I would love to change, I know that at the end of the day, faith in Jesus, in his compassion and his power, is the only antidote to peacelessness in my life. So if you are looking for peace this Christmas, I want to propose a little perspective shift from looking for solutions to coming to Jesus with these questions. Come and see, come and ask. Jesus, who are you really? And Jesus, do you care? Show me your power. Show me your compassion. I believe he will answer. And I trust that peace is to be found in the answers and in him. So my little challenge before the challenge is a practical way to do that is to come along to Alpha in the new year. The disciples turn to each other and they question, who is this man? Come join us in January and ask some other people and ask God and ask yourself, who is this man? Who is Jesus? Does he have the power? Does he have the compassion to make a difference in my life? Come and ask those questions at Alpha in January. But our challenge for today for all of us is to let us pray for you today. Number one, we want to pray for you today before you leave here that you will have peace this Christmas. We want to pray for peace for you. If, there's, if you're like just generally feeling a lacking in peace, we want to pray for peace for you. Maybe there's a particular circumstance or an, a thing or an illness or a family situation or something that you're like, I need peace in this thing. We want to pray peace over that for you this morning. And the second challenge is to pray for peace for someone else. <laughs> because if we all do this this morning, then we're all going to get prayed for and we're all going to pray for someone else. To pray for peace for someone else. But I would say, if this is your very first time here, or you're visiting today, or you're coming back into church in this season, kind of edging your way in, wondering if there's something true for you here, we'd love to pray for you this morning. And it's not like a big fussy thing. But if there's anything on your heart, we can ask God to move on your behalf. And I'd invite you just to come and see. Come and see what he can do. Come and watch. Stick around with us for a bit. 
and I believe he can move on your behalf. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go into our time of response just now. Jesus, I thank you that you are the Prince of Peace, and you are strong, and you are ruling and reigning today, victorious over fear, victorious over despair, victorious over anything we can face on this earth, Lord, anything that feels like it might have control, anything evil, anything broken, Jesus, you have defeated it. And one day you will come back and you'll wipe every tear from every eye and you will reign perfectly and unite all things to yourself. Thank you for that. I pray that that would sink deep for us today, that we would know that, hold on to that, have hope in that. And God, for anyone today in this room who's like, I need peace. I need this not to just be like good talk. I need the peace of Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, come. Pour out peace in this place today. Lord, prompt us to pray for each other. Prompt us to ask for prayer. But Holy Spirit, come and move. As we worship you, as we respond to your word, come and move. Lord Jesus, come. In your name we pray. Amen.